And welcome back. And we're moving into our first segment for the morning. Then again, something very uh, close to us. Building and strengthening family connections. And uh, in to tell us all about it is none other than professional counselor, Krista Courtney. Good morning. It's so nice to see you looking lovely. <laughs> and welcome. You, Thank you for having me. <laughs> so, you know, it, it is definitely a, a, a connection when it comes to topics because of, especially of the eye-opener and what we were talking about, building and strengthening family connections. Firstly, I'd like to, I'd like to venture off and ask you, when we talk about family, what are we responding to here? What? I think it's important to mention that family can mean a lot of different things. I mean, most of us consider family to be those that are connected to us by blood. Yeah. Your immediate family, you have your partner, if there is one. Mm -hmm. um, you have your children, you have your parents, your aunts, your uncles, cousins. But family can really be any combination of people that is in your close network that is supportive and all about you. We have cousins by love. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everybody that calls. Um, yeah. And so it doesn't have to necessarily be that your blood family is the only family that you connect with. Yeah. But I think it's really where you feel connected. And, and the flip side, is the flip side also true? Can you also be connected to someone by blood? Sorry, can you also be related to someone by blood, but because you're not connected to them, are they excluded from the definition of family? It can be, wow. but I think family is who you personally are connected to or feel connected to. Mm -hmm. I think if you look at the, you, you have families, for instance, who children move away, the relationships aren't that great, and the connection is lost. So yes, by blood definition, they are still your family, but they may not be the family that you connect with. Yeah. I think we use the same analogy when we're talking about children who come into adopted families. Yes. Yeah. We don't want to consider that because we're not blood, you're not part you're of our family. family. Yeah. Right, and then sometimes you connect to brothers <laughs> that are not necessarily your blood, yeah. but you grow like brothers and you treat each other that way, you believe that, you feel connected in that way. Yeah. So I really think without um, getting too much into the scientific definition, mm -hmm. I think for me and where I come from or my, my approach on life is more the relational definition mm -hmm. rather than the scientific definition of family. Uh, I, you know, I love the way that uh, you dissect that because it actually, it actually showcases who we are as a people indeed because this is my brother, you know, and you, as long as you feel connected to that individual, it might not be your blood brother, but that individual actually becomes a part of you. And some folks might say, you know what, you guys hang out a lot, you're starting to look alike. <laughs> you know, it's a part of it, but let's jump on into strengthening the family. There, there must be steps to strengthen a family. In today's day and age, Kev, and uh, uh, Krista, we're seeing young families out there and we don't know how to bond with each other because we left the nest at a very young age. So steps in strengthening the family. Okay. Um, I think something that's very important is that the steps are, I'm going to offer are more general because again, each person's road to connecting and building their own family's connections is going to be a bit unique, yeah. right? So there's no one size fits all per se, yeah. but there are some global things that then you pick individual tracks within that concept. So for instance, I think I say it a lot, people that have talked to me probably have heard me say a lot, the last two things that people Google are parenting and relationships. Wow. wow. I mean, they'll Google and Pinterest how to throw the best baby shower or <laughs> how to improve their basketball game. But a lot of people don't Google relationships and parenting. For some reason, we tend to believe that because we have parents or we've seen how parents operate or that we've always wanted children and we want to raise our children sometimes the way we were raised and sometimes definitely not the way we were <laughs> raised, that we think we know what we're doing. Yeah. A lot of times I think people will identify in private. I have no idea what I'm doing and I'm totally terrified. Um, but admitting that to other people, seeking social support, getting information about the topic seems yeah. to be something that people don't necessarily feel confident to do. Wow. And so I think one of the first things in building and strengthening family connections, get informed. 
there are so many websites, resources, parenting websites. There's so many different things, and you can then pick and choose what's right for you. Yeah. The, the, the web won't necessarily have things uh, about family and parenting that are specific to the Caribbean and to Belize. Actually, I it does. think it does. Wow. Where? There's a lot of research that has been done, not necessarily specific to Belize, but a lot of the things are cross-cultural. I think this is one of the, the trains of thought that I'd love to break mm -hmm. this morning. Nice. <laughs> is that getting informed, getting information, asking questions, reading an article, it does sometimes require a little bit of your own ability to take the information and apply it in your own circumstance. Yeah. And I think maybe that skill isn't always present and so it feels like this information is irrelevant to me. Mm -hmm. But it's really not. I mean, getting informed is cross-cultural yes. about a particular topic. If I'm going into a particular job, the first thing that I do, I have to learn mm -hmm. what it is I need to do. And it's gonna be uncomfortable at first. I think a lot of times people are resistant to getting informed because they don't believe they know how to implement the information they find. It's deep. And what? I think that's uh, an important thing. So you get information, but then how do I implement it? That may take a different level of skill where sometimes relationships with a professional can help. Yeah. If you can do it on your own and things improve, it's to really take a more experiential, uh, experimental approach. What? I take something, I try it. If it works, I keep going. If it doesn't work, I try to modify. What, what if you're saying that there is information which is uh, specific to the Caribbean, not necessarily to Belize, but to the Caribbean. But what of those parents out there, as you said, who model their parenting style based on their experience, who say a lot of this information is coming from America, for example, um, and the parenting styles there don't seem to be working very well because when I go to the States and I look at the children throwing tantrums in the grocery store, or having mass shootings in the schools uh, can't be an example of good parenting. Or when we see some of the bad experiences that we have with children um, coming to the Caribbean on, on vacation, uh, we're thinking, man, if I ever said that to my parent, and I'm pretty fine. So how do we balance you saying taking the information, making it relative to me, and looking at their parenting style and saying that that's not really a success story in my book? Well. I think you've made a very overgeneralized statement, if okay. I may. <laughs> yeah, help me out. I mean, if I judge Belize by the two or three people I meet when I come on a visit, it could be wonderful or it could be really horrible. Yeah. Um, so I think to judge the global parenting style of an entire country <laughs> by the few examples that you see in a grocery store is a bit of a stretch, if you if w would allow, but I can get what you're saying, that there are certain ideas that we think are westernized and maybe they're not working. But I beg that some of the parenting information that's out there coming from perhaps the western, what you see. When I'm talking about getting informed, I'm talking about sites, information that have scientific research mm -hmm. and tried and true, <laughs> right, <laughs> um, techniques not just the you know this is how i parent my kid or following some social media you know popular mm -hmm. person um so when i'm talking about getting informed i really am talking about weeding through some of those things perhaps mm -hmm. and i that can be difficult so i think again talking with a professional in the field um searching out websites that you know we we have to be a little more discriminate now with mm -hmm. the information that we take in mm -hmm. Everything that's out there is not real. I mean, they used to say because it's on the internet, it's true. <laughs> we know now that that is not the case. Um, and so I really do think we want to rely more on outside people to tell us what's right. Mm -hmm. But I really think we have to work on things like meditation, yoga, mindfulness, things that help us to connect with what's right for me. You know, I, as long I, as I'm not violating the rights of those around me at the same time. While listening to the conversation, I could actually hear some resistance from home. And the reason why I say that is because we normally model, and I, and I, I hope I could use the word normally, model our parenting style from what we've seen. So why would I want to go and read something on the internet 
when to me, because this is what I've learned, I, you know, and I always use the analogy there is this, uh, this family, they lost their baby or they actually didn't know what to do with the baby. They put it in the bushes. Then uh, it was brought up by some apes. Then they called him Tarzan and he was swinging across. But this was his brought up. So this is how he grew up. And what he uh, grew up seeing is exactly what he portrays as a family man. And the same thing occurs right here with us, right here at home. So why would I want to go on out and read about how to be a better parent when I'm just modeling what I see? I think, again, to take a more experimental approach. And by experimental, I'm really talking scientifically experimental, right? We isolate all of the external voices. We try something for a specific period of time that is not tainted by something else and we look at what the result is. Mm. So for instance, if I am modeling my parenting style over on what I've seen, what my parents did, what my friend's parents did, and maybe I see something that I don't want my kid to be raised that way. You know, there were certain things about my childhood that I didn't like or you apply that then, I don't want my children to feel this way or to do this, so I'm gonna do it different. But I really do challenge people to understand that wanting to be different and knowing how to do it different mm -hmm. are two very different things. And oftentimes people end up repeating the same patterns, perhaps in different contexts, different ways, because your children are not you. Yeah. Although they're your blood, they're now your blood plus somebody else's. <laughs> and so you have family <laughs> dynamics and cycles and familial patterns, emotional patterns of responding, things that you value. And so you push those more than the things that you don't value. And so every single family has their own sort of dynamic. And it's important to question that a little bit, yeah. not to change everything. You may find that in your questioning, there's things I like, I want to hold on to those, but there's things I don't like and I don't know how to remove them. Yeah. I don't know how to overcome them. That's when you need to seek out that information to help you do that. Krista, take for example, as, as you're speaking and I'm going through what parenting, the reality of what parenting is in <laughs> Belize for me okay. um, and my experience. One example of, we're talking about your first tip, which is get informed, uh, take information, make it relative. But one, I'm sure on all of these tips websites, there is communication. Talk to your children. I'm sure that's probably number one. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Very much. But in Belize, the culture here, the parenting culture, which has sort of worked okay for years, is I don't communicate with you. I talk to you. So I tell you, go clean your room. I don't want to hear an explanation. I do not want to hear a soliloquy. It's not, this, this is a rhetorical parenting. Um, but it seems to give you, to every down, there's an up, because it creates some discipline. So how do you now assimilate this whole culture of having a debate with your child? Because that's the way most parents look at it, that see you know, that hard line parenting of, listen, do as I say, See, not, as, not I as I do. Yeah. This is not a debate. How do you balance that level of information? Yeah. I think, again, you've made a very good point in that what we see a lot is that children are seen and not heard. Yes. <laughs> um, and I can tell you that some of your youth organizations are trying to give you a different spin on that. Um, and again, I think it's everything in moderation. Yeah. When it comes to do certain things because they build a sense of responsibility, do certain things because I say so, because I know or I think, mm -hmm. it builds a sense of character. Yeah. You know, cleanliness is next to godliness. You have to clean your room. You have to pick up after yourself. You need to move your dishes when you get up from the table. I mean, whatever the value is that the parent wants to instill, I think there's room for go do this, I'm not hearing any excuses, this is it. That doesn't necessarily mean that I don't give my children an opportunity at some other time mm -hmm. to talk to me about how they feel. I think a lot of times parents are uncomfortable hearing how their children feel because yes. they don't know what to do with that information. Quite honestly, if you listen to a child and they tell you their thoughts, that can be pretty scary. And the older they get, it's even scarier. <laughs> But, you know, I, I, I love the way the topic is going, really, because it reflects me. Because, you know, I am a proud dad. And I listen to Jenny a lot, and Marlene a lot, and Kev a lot. I listen to the media on a whole. 
But one of the things that I think that we take away from our kids, or as parents, what we do is that we're, we actually model that authoritative parent. Rather, and we forget that our children are actually not our possession. They, we, we're just, we're just the, that, that bridge for them to continue on. Absolutely. We, we, we tend to uh, look at our kids as our prized possession, like, like you know, they're, they're actually your possession, enough, you know. But at the same time, and I, I noticed the facial expression. And a expression. direct reflection of yes, you. Yes, <laughs> yes. But one of the things, in terms of building a family, Absolutely. shouldn't we give them that voice? Aren't we supposed to listen to them? Even though what we hear from them might be something you don't want to hear, because they're out there. What do you think? I do. I think that there is room for a time for conversations to happen where however the child feels, whatever they think, is somehow validated. Not that you say it's okay. <laughs> you don't necessarily have to agree with your child. I think Democracy. for those of you that perhaps have spouses or female partners, <laughs> I think you find it challenging sometimes because a lot of times people feel that if I listen to you, I must offer you a solution or I must somehow try to fix it for you. And that's not necessarily that's the case. Would, Listening yeah. empathically, being able to listen to someone, tell you how they feel, and not feel the sense of obligation to change that is, I think, an enormous skill that helps people just to feel heard. Is Sometimes it? just feeling heard is all, I'll solve my own problem. I really don't need you to fix it. I just need you to hear me yeah, out. Yeah, I yeah. need to say it. So, but isn't the whole purpose of parenting to mold the child? Um, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, this weekend, I was at a friend's house, and his daughter was upset because she was told to clean her room. She had, she had been told, and she hadn't done so. Mm -hmm. And there was the exchange, the normal reason exchange, and you know, he got into trouble. And uh, there was a door slamming, and they, coming from the room, while well, cleaning the room for the child, was, you hate me. You, you never, you always treat me bad. And I could recall being there a few weeks before, right. mm -hmm. and that exact same language coming from a movie. So what the child was actually repeating was probably the way they felt, mm -hmm. but was probably mimicked, not from anything that mommy, because it's a very loving household, mm -hmm but more so from a movie that they were watching, that that was quite normal for the child to say in response to something that they didn't like, I hate you. If I ever said that to my parents, <laughs> knowing that you don't believe it, or even saying it, man, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh -huh. my, my, my point is, and my question is, in terms of being able to balance what the child legitimately feels, and what they're mimicking or what they're trying to manipulate. Because children are very manipulative. And the Absolutely. older they get, the more manipulative they, manipulative, the more manipulative mm -hmm. they become. So how do you balance that? Because to me, it's all about balance. It's, as you were saying, how do you balance what they actually feel and connecting with them on what they actually are as opposed to what they're projecting? I think that would require a number of different things. Starting with, know your picnic. <laughs> I mean, if I know my child, I'm connected to my child, we have conversations, yeah. I know what is the true you, and then if I hear you mimicking something that that not sound like you, that, that, that sounds foreign, where did you get this from? But just asking in, where did this come from? Yeah. What made you say that? You know, and I think sometimes we feel like we can't let our, <laughs> our children speak. I think that was a disrespectful exchange and Very. needs a follow-up conversation. Mm -hmm. Not a spanking tool? No, no. I can't speak to that. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, again, there is room for discipline, mm -hmm. but I think you have to discipline in a way that kind of works for you without following, falling into abusive type situations. Yes. But I also think, again, connection with your kid. If you don't talk to your kid and you don't, your child doesn't talk to you, mm -hmm or they don't feel they can talk to you because you don't listen, you just mm -hmm. talk at me. Mm -hmm. Or if I say, mom, you know, I'm having trouble with this or this person said this to me and it really made me angry today. And your answer is, don't, no pay them no mind, just ignore them. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like you've heard me. I don't feel like you care <laughs> about the fact that I'm suffering. Mm -hmm. I think we forget that these are tiny little humans and they only have so much experience. Yeah. 
we, we say a lot that children are experience rich, but language poor. Wow. They're having experiences from the time they wake up to the time they go to bed. Mm -hmm. They're having experiences with friends at school, with teachers, with aunties, with uncles, with cousins. They're having experiences all day long, mm -hmm. but they don't have the language all the time to express how those experiences affect them. And why, why is that? Just their level of cognitive maturity, mm -hmm. I think, right? Because at different stages, your brain is developing differently. The ability to connect, even the connections between the different parts of your brain that process mm -hmm. an interaction. So there's the senses, my five senses that are sensing the temperature in the room. There's my gut instinct that's connecting with whether you're a safe person or not, perhaps. Mm -hmm. There may be nerves involved. There may be um, the tone of your voice, <laughs> right? Your body language. There's so many different things that are coming at you in an interaction with other people. Mm -hmm. And there's different parts of your brain that process each section of that and integrate it. And the integrated part is what takes children a while to develop, which is why they have an experience they think very concretely, mm -hmm. right? You're not allowed to have juice, okay? But I can have juice on some days, mm -hmm. not on other days. Like it gets really, <laughs> the exceptions <laughs> to the rule in life get really confusing the younger you are. As you mature, you understand that there's a time and a place for different things, and yeah. different things are appropriate at so different I, times. I, I, hold on. I, I want to go back to what Kev was <laughs> saying. I want to go back to what Kev, Kev was saying in terms of what occurred in the home, uh -huh. which, of course, is blatant. There's some kind of a resistance from the child. Remember, we're actually discussing building and strengthening the family. So the question is, is resistance in the home from the child or from your uh, significant other, is that a, a form of strengthening and building? It's an opportunity, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Whenever you meet resistance, I think rather than shy away from it, sweep it under the rug, try to go sleep and start again the next day, it's important to follow it up, ask questions, try to understand where it's coming from because more than likely it's not what you think. <laughs> because men don't interpret women properly, women don't interpret men properly, and then parents interpreting children really sometimes get it very wrong. Maybe the men do interpret women differently, <laughs> but they're very smart. <laughs> but that, we're, uh, that's a whole different day. <laughs> you invite yeah, me back for that the, one. That's tip number one. Uh -huh. uh, can you give us more? Sure. I think, first of all, get informed, right? Staying connected, I need to also, I think, point out that when I'm talking about building and strengthening family connections, you can have a very well-connected family, but you don't have total compliance from your children all yeah, the time. Yeah. I think there's a difference between connection and compliance. You don't get cooperation from anybody in your family or outside of your family, in your organization, in your business, in anywhere without appropriate connection. But you may have compliance. So I can obey your rules, yes. but inside I hate you. I could do what you tell me to do because I can't afford to move out, but that no means say I agree with you. Yeah. So the difference between cooperation and compliance, and I think a lot of parents are striving for compliance. <laughs> I want you to obey me, do what I say so that I'm not scared. Mm. You know, don't go out too late, don't stay out past this time. Yes, because I want you to be safe, but also because I don't want to be up scared. So you know you can't go anywhere. Or you can't hang out with your friends or you can't do this or you can't do that because I'm afraid you might do something I don't approve of. Yeah. They're going to at some point. It doesn't mean you condone it, but it means that parents have to deal with their own issues, resistance mm -hmm. regarding parenting and ch while children are exploring their independence to a certain degree. I think there are limits that are healthy, but I think it's important to understand that a well-connected family doesn't necessarily have total compliance and obedience all the time. Yeah. Chris, doesn't this, doesn't this serve uh, a social purpose um, in terms of compliance for most families, a lot of families in Belize, is connected to a belt. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, that's, that, that's the ultimate book. Mm -hmm. um, but Socially, after, because after you come out of the family, you are part of a wider society, and that society requires compliance, whether or not you agree or hate it. And so doesn't that function or that exchange? Because the, 
that compliance will never be 100%. Children, but you there's want no fun. You want compliance because you're connected, and you want compliance in the form of cooperation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? But when children are very young, we focus on compliance. It yeah. is an experiment in behavior modification, basically. You do something that's unsafe, that could possibly kill you, you don't realize that, but I have to discipline you and tell you a very firm no, swat the hand, put you in timeout, do different things to help you understand, don't do that. Mainly because a three-year-old doesn't understand that they can kill themselves. A teenager, a teenager <laughs> they is can't. Worse. Well, it continues, <laughs> but it's at different levels. Yeah. The mm -hmm. more integrated the child's brain, the more they learn, the more experiences they have, you can reason with them to a certain degree. Again, it's not about control. You want to instill in the child as they grow the ability to think for themselves and make healthy choices for themselves. Mm -hmm. Because I think people don't really understand that when children reach those teenage years, they move away from their family of origin as a source of support a lot more. It's now their time to sort of figure out what are the social norms, what's you know, okay from what's not okay. They try on different styles of dressing. They, start, they try on different attitudes. Mm -hmm. They try swearing. You know, they try on different language or different people that they or identify drugs. with. They get into sometimes things that are very difficult to get out of. Yeah. Now again, having a strong family connection can help in some ways to prevent the need for that type of far-reaching, more dangerous exploration. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think even if a child does venture too far mm -hmm. and get themselves into trouble, it's the connection with the family that's going to be a protective factor in helping them to get back to a healthy place. Uh, you know, one of the things that we keep on hearing, and this, this, is, this is out there, especially for young parents, and I, and I keep on stressing young parents because that's the reality that we live in, whereby kids are actually having kids. And uh, you're 30, your child is somewhere around 15. <laughs> you know, it's the reality. But one of the things that we notice out there is that I build a relationship with my child so she or he can tell me anything and we discuss anything and we're like friends and I don't hit her, I don't hit him and I take them to the club and I take them to places that I would normally socialize rather than, and, and of course go to where they would socialize. Would you say this is a good thing in terms of building and strengthening that family bond with your children? Or must there be some kind of a uh, break to, to different things? I do believe that in order to maintain a certain um, healthy boundary with your child, mm -hmm. that there need to be clear lines as to where I as a parent end and you as a child begin. Mm -hmm. And we can be friendly. But I think to put you and your child, your teenager, on the same level as friends where you share everything, mm -hmm. that would cross over perhaps into what we would call an enmeshed family where you're over-involved in each other's lives. Wow. Um, now for some people, because of their backgrounds or their upbringing, it works for them. I think you really have to, there is no right or wrong, there is no good, no uh, bad. It's what's working for you, mm -hmm. what's not working for you, are you getting the results that you want? Is your child headed the direction you'd like them to go? Do you see them making healthy choices for themselves? Do they do things that terrify you? Okay, but is it a terrifying that I can handle, I can live with while they're exploring? I mean, when your child first starts to walk, we're right there. Yeah, I'm doing you know, And dad says, let them fall, because they understand they need to grow, they need to learn. We learn by doing things that we have to do, if you really think about it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we yeah. adult because we have to. <laughs> we don't really have to, but if you want certain results, you sort of acknowledge that there are certain things I have to do. You know, the, the, it's, it's just deep to hear you talk, uh, to talk about it uh, that way. And especially for those who are actually watching and saying, you know what, I, could, I reckon with that. I reckon with that because these are some of the things that I'm seeing. But they actually have a, a better opportunity rather than watching the show they could actually be a part of an interactive summer camp that's coming up. Let's jump on into that. Uh, Connect to Protect Interactive Summer Camp, July 31st to August 3rd. Wow. Yes. Can you tell us more <laughs> about it? Absolutely. Um, it's something I really wanted to do for a long time, and I finally decided that this year would not pass me by without offering it. 2018. And I think... <laughs> 
Um, the, the workshop is geared towards both teenagers and their parents. And yeah. I'm really hoping to get participation from the parents of the teens who are participating, but that's not necessarily a, a requirement. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can have parents that children are not involved or children where the parents don't come. That's fine too. Mm -hmm. But the idea is to grab a hold of teenagers, 12 to 15 is my target for this particular offering, um, to try and help introduce the idea of living mindfully, which is just living on purpose. I am able to create some distance between something happening to me and how I react to it mm -hmm. so that I have more control over the outcome, right? Um, nobody has total control, but I want a little bit more ability to work this outcome the way that yeah. I want it. <laughs> um, but I also think that we're going to teach concrete coping skills. So the coping skills that we'll introduce will actually practice. And so it's hands-on, we're doing it, I'll tell you certain things, and then you practice it while can we're you, together. Can you give us a teaser of the coping mechanism? <laughs> one scenario? And well, one of the things that I, I want to introduce is the concept of journaling, but journaling therapeutically. A lot of people hear journaling and think, oh, I must write today's date and everything that happened today mm -hmm. and how I felt about it. And there is some value to that, if yeah. that's something that you connect with, but not everybody connects with a daily journal. Some people say, oh, I can never keep up with it. Yeah. You know, I write for three days and then three months go by and I haven't written anything and I feel like I'm failing at yeah. my journal. Journaling therapeutically has no rules. There's no grammar, there's no language preferences. You could curse bad word and you can switch tones of voice and emotion from one sentence to the next or from the beginning to the end. There really is no particular format except that it is a free flow of exactly how things come up in the back of your mind trying to get yourself to allow yourself to put that down on paper i could imagine if my parents found my journal if i ever <laughs> <laughs> well here's the thing there's different techniques and i think again that's something important to mention is yeah. people are afraid to keep that type of thing yeah. around and i don't if you're not in a safe place where you think you can secure those unfiltered thoughts and ideas because a lot of times feelings are not facts it can be a yeah. fact that i feel this way yeah. yeah but because i feel you don't like me it's not necessarily a fact that you don't yeah right and so i can feel like my life is falling apart today it doesn't mean that it actually is but sometimes i need to express that yeah. so teaching people how to access those thoughts because as we talk or write some of the things that are irrational the feelings that are really big but they're not real can flow and we can release them and we have a much clearer head we kind of get out all the things that we need to get out and we're left with the things that we really need to deal with yeah, there you and go. so the, teaching people how to journal and practice doing that and I always say if you don't have a safe place to keep your journal read it over again once so that your senses take it in differently you than how it was expressed and then destroy it. Ah, yeah, I read my mind. See, it's absolutely okay to do that. Now imagine, Kev, you, uh, <laughs> you venture off to uh, a summer, uh, interactive summer camp such as this one and what happens to the mind thereafter. So it's <laughs> going to be from July 31st to August 3rd. Uh, where is it going to be? What time? And is there a cost, cost to it? Yeah. Yes, there is a cost. Um, I have the girls and boys separated because again, the social issues that come up for girls and for boys, although similar, are kind of different. Um, and so I want them to be able to express themselves in their own way. Um, so the girls' sessions in the morning from Tuesday to Friday will be 9 to 12. Okay. The boys' sessions will be 1.30 to 4.30 mm -hmm. in the afternoon. Wow. And the parent sessions are Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. And then I'll offer a little bit of time at the end if there's anybody that has specific questions or extended conversations can, develop. Can I ask this before? I know we're wrapping up now, but what happens in a scenario where you have probably only the child and not the parent? And, you know, the, the child goes back home and tries to implement, implement yes. some of the things that you are... Yeah, which is why I would really love the parents to be there because yeah. if I'm telling your child to try to express yourself this way, understand that parents don't always know what they're doing. <laughs> you know, give a little leeway because I think kids do expect their parents to read their minds and yeah. know what they're feeling yeah. and know when to hug and when not to hug and it's really confusing. 
Um, so I think, again, ideally, at least one of the parents from the unit would be able to participate in the evening sessions. But if not, we can just deal with that child directly and help them understand to, you know, keep their expectations a little, a little open. And can I ask you my final question? Sure. Um, which is, a lot of people don't have the benefit of having their parents, both parents, with them. For example, a lot of persons who are not necessarily from the core family. So it might be a child from another relationship, either one previously or one from the current one. Mm -hmm. um, I would assume that they fall in as part of the construct of what a family is. How do you strengthen those relationships and build those relationships when you have that social barrier of not having them be part of what the formalized system mm -hmm. of family is? I think, again, it would be a more specific thing that we'd have to kind of take some extra attention to. But the skills that we'll present during the camp mm -hmm. can be used no matter what your family structure is. Well, I, let's take, for example, somebody who has a, a child, who believes he's an old child. child. Mm -hmm. I hate the term. But uh, it won't even allow me to build a relationship with, with the child because the child presents so much more than just a child who's a part of a family mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. needs all of these strengthening and who needs all of these connections. So I'm not even, e even able to meet the child, much less to connect with the child. Right. And again, that's not something I can particularly solve for you. <laughs> um, there are... How do you build a, a relationship in that scenario? It's very difficult, and you may not be able to. If you don't have access, then it's very difficult to build a connection or yeah. a relationship. And so there are certain things that do need to be in place. And again, I think it's also good to understand that the focus of the particular camp is to build, I'm hoping, on something that kind of exists. Oh, um, and we strengthen family connections. Right. If you're learning how to develop family connections, right, and to, that's a different level of attention mm -hmm. and, and focus, and I think requires something more um, specific. Right. Uh, and, and, so, and so where the camp will be again? Uh, we're going to have it at the UWI, uh, Open UB. Campus <laughs> Auditorium, sorry. I was no thinking problem. OYE, but it's UWI. <laughs> At the UWI Open Campus in their auditorium uh -huh. is where we're holding it. I wanted it to be somewhere that's comfortable Open. for everybody. Yeah. Um, we have enough space to spread yeah. out and really kind of get into our activities. And But it will not be lecture style. It's very interactive. So we present information, but then we give you an opportunity to really get in there, practice it, ask your questions, and, and, and learn as much as you can. Lovely. All right. I love it. So interactive summer camp, July 31st to August 3rd. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be good. And if you need some more information, you could uh, link up on. You yes. have a Facebook where um, you could get the information? <laughs> I, it is posted on Facebook, on my Krista Courtney Facebook page. Uh -huh. um, you can also reach me at 670-6080. I prefer text message or WhatsApp because mm -hmm. if I'm in sessions, I don't answer my phone. But okay. a message, I can follow it up then afterwards. Right. Um, or there's an email address as well. All right. So why not be a part of it? This summer is definitely one to uh, reckon with Krista Courtney. Thank you so very much. She Thank is you very a much professional for counselor me. <laughs> as well. From professional counseling, Coming up next, we'll be meeting a young lady who went out on the limb and, of course, became, became an entrepreneur. Actually, the name of it, Hello Body Belize. So stay with us. We'll be venturing off there when we come back.